la tenue. Euh, vous êtes tellement nombreux, c'est vraiment encourageant, euh, merci. I, just to, to begin, I want to acknowledge that we're gathering here today on traditional and unceded uh, territory of the Algonquin Nation. And I'm honored uh, today to have with us an elder from Kittigan ZB, Anish Nabek, the Claudette Commander. She's just returned from the meeting of the UN Permanent Council on Indigenous Issues. Elder Kamanda is the Executive Director for the First Nations Confederacy of Culture, Cultural Education Centers. For the past 30 years, she's been dedicated to promoting First Nations people, history, culture, language, traditional knowledge and rights in various capacities as a University of Ottawa student, a professor, a member and chair of the Education Council, the Aboriginal Education Council, and in the public forum via various, various speaking engagements. Elder Commanda, thank you for being with us today. <laughs> Good afternoon. Elder? No. Old lady? Yes. <laughs> and I couldn't help it when I walked in. They said there's a special seat for you. And I walked over here and I saw the word reserved. No pen pun intended. <laughs> uh, but what? Uh, it works well because you are all going to hear about the. Uh, the famous Indian Act and uh, the reserves <laughs> under this Indian Act. But uh, thank you, Jennifer, um, for the respect of the Algonquin people and our protocols. I really do appreciate that. So to each and every one of you, welcome each and every one of you it is an honor to greet you, to welcome you to this unsurrendered, unceded, beautiful territory of the Algonquin people. The land that has been given to us by the Creator since time immemorial, and the land to ensure that will always be here forevermore for our children. Today, you're gathered here to this workshop to hear a fundamental topic, understanding the Indian Act. I can tell you as a First Nation person living under the Indian Act since birth, I'll never come to understand it. It is so complicated. But you need to learn about this Indian Act. You, le you need to learn about this law which has been in since 1867, even before 1867, and its impacts that it has had on First Nations people, and it continues to have. And you have three remarkable speakers here that are going to share their knowledge about this Indian Act. So to each and every one of you, thank you for being here. Enjoy. Please listen with an open mind, an open heart, and an open spirit. Thank you. Take care, and I wish you well. Miigwech. Phone's working, yes. Uh, I want to give a thank you as well uh, to Carleton University's Faculty of Public Affairs, including the School of Public Policy and Administration and the School of Journalism and Communication, for partnering with Policy Options today to put on this workshop. And welcome to the students who are here today in the room. And I have to confess that today I am very much a student. Uh, I had a, a large amount of self interest in putting this workshop on because I felt like uh, discussions about the Indian Act were going right over my head. I, I took Canadian history in high school, in Seja, and in university, and I never learned about the Indian Act. Why is it important to learn about the Indian Act? Claudette Kamanda told us a little bit there, but it's also a le the legal framework which governs the relationship between First Nations people and the Crown and between First Nations people and the Government of Canada, and it's been here for 146 years. A few days ago, Justice Minister Jody Wilson-Raybould told APTN that the Indian Act in this country, quote, represents an impoverished notion of government. So the Prime Minister has struck a review 
uh, ministerial task force actually to review all indigenous laws and policies and the act will be a central component of that review. I'm really hoping to learn uh, a lot today along with you, but the experts are here. <laughs> so without further ado, I'm going to uh, start uh, our workshop, Frances, um, and I'm going to introduce her. Uh, Frances Abel is a professor in the School of Public Policy and Administration at Carleton University and ac academic director of the Carleton Center for Community Innovation. She's worked with the Center for First Nations Governance and a number of other think tanks and research institutes, including the IRPP. And she was Deputy Director of Research for the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Okay, just a second here. Sorry about that. That's okay. I can start talking while you do that. Yes. All right. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we're double teaming on the technical work here, so <laughs> thank you. The, the, um, uh, there's, a lot, there's way too much to say about the Indian Act. Um, what I'm going to say today arises from uh, research that I did for uh, the Center for First Nations Governance. Some people in the room will know um, Herb Satsan, Herb George, or Patricia Montour. They were the people who dreamed up this project. And what they asked me to do uh, over 10 years ago um, was to, can you hear me? I have to speak to it. It's not normal. <laughs> can I do this? Yeah, okay. Um, I, what I'm going to speak to today comes out of some work that I did for the Center for First Nations Governance, uh, an organi a non-governmental organization, an Aboriginal think tank founded by Satsan Herb George. Um, he and Patricia Montour uh, commissioned a series of studies in 2007 dealing with the Indian Act, the Federal Indian Act. They're all still available online. You can read mine. What they asked me to do was to look at the Indian Act as um, a constitution for government. They said, don't do any empirical research. Forget what you know about how people make it work. And just read the Act and do a systems analysis, they called it. Just understand how it works as a system. And uh, dubiously, I, I agreed to do this. And I spent the long winter of 2006, 6, 2007 living inside the Indian Act in my imagination. Oh, I'm a, um, a white girl from southern Alberta. I thought I knew all about the Indian Act, but I didn't understand the Indian Act at all until that winter. By about March, I contacted Patricia and I said, I can't do this. I just can't write it. I'm not going to do it. And she said, you're going to do it, uh, but you have to calm down. <laughs> Those of you who knew her, <laughs> you're going to do it. I was angry. I was in despair. I couldn't get away from the feeling there that oppressive, implacable, calm voice of authority over the people to whom that act applies. And for me, that was an important life lesson. It led to the report that I wrote for them, and I'm going to speak a bit to it today. Um, I would. That would be great. There you go. Thank you. And I won't rattle so much then. I got Claudette's. <laughs> So today I want to talk a little bit about the history of the Indian Act, because that was my assignment from Jennifer. Um, and I would like to make just two points about the history of the Indian Act. Um, probably the most important thing you could say is that uh, the Indian Act has its origins in British imperial policy with respect to indigenous peoples. But to say it has its origins does not mean that it no longer reflects that origin. It embeds, embodies in our country those 19th century ideas about racial superiority and cultural assimil and social assimilation. The, you got to go back a little bit farther in British imperial history to think about uh, the important uh, milestones in the British crown coming to terms with how it was going to think about indigenous people in the settler colonies. The 1763 Royal Proclamation is rightly looked to uh, by many Indigenous lawyers and others as an important foundational document that recognizes Indigenous sovereignty. 
It does that, but it also asserts crown authority over indigenous territories. It reserves to the British crown the right to make treaty with indigenous people who, have, who were understood to have sovereignty in British North America at that time. By 1840, um, you start to see a much more um, oppressive and interventionist colonial policy emerging. The idea of um, blood quantum and adoption for the control of citizenship in general of indigenous nations was claimed by the British Crown um, in this act that I've got, that I show you there. And then in a series of other pieces of legislation, the Gradual Civilization Act, the Gradual Enfranchisement Act, and the 1867 Constitution, two things happened. The race-based quality of the Indian Act is entrenched, entrenched in the Canadian Constitution, and federal jurisdiction over Indigenous people is asserted. Executive authority over Indigenous people is entrenched. That um, administrative practice lives in tension and contradiction with the other principle, the other historical reality, which is that from the moment the Europeans came to British North America, they what became British North America, they were forced to make treaties with the indigenous authorities, with the people who were already here. And this is a list of the, the conventional um, listing of the, the different periods of treaty making, every one of those waves, those three waves, the peace and friendship, the numbered treaties, and the modern treaties, recognize indigenous sovereignty. The Indian Act not only contradicts indigenous sovereignty, but it also radically transforms the relationship between indigenous people as citizens and the, and the state and the crown. You'll notice on this list that um, the Dominion government stopped negotiating treaties in 1921. The last treaty was Treaty 11, which was negotiated for the western part of the, well, what is now the Northwest Territories, the western part of the then Northwest Territories. Then between 1921 and 1976, no treaties were negotiated, even though vast areas of Canada were still not covered by treaty. They were still, uh, had a cloud on, on Crown sovereignty. And it wasn't until the rising of the indigenous movement starting in the immediate post-war period with the return of Indian veterans and accelerating through the 1960s that eventually through a series of court cases and um, political pressure, indigenous people compelled the federal government to begin negotiating again for their land rights, their sovereign land rights. And so we had the modern treaties. It depends how you count them, but there were somewhere between 16 and 28 there are between somewhere between 16 and 28 modern treaties. Still not complete, most of British Columbia is not covered by treaty. But those treaties all have a number of features the Indian Act lacks. First, they're parallel structures. They're negotiated between an indigenous authority and the crown. The Indian Act is an administrative act of the legislature that puts in place executive authority over all of the people who fall under its jurisdiction. Secondly, the treaties envision a future of collaboration and mutuality, uh, both in terms of what's written, but especially in terms of what people understood when they were negotiated. And so those treaties are, are, are directly and daily contradicted by the Indian Act, which has created a system of um, micro-governments across the country, small um, bands under the Indian Act, um, in which small groups of people attempt to govern themselves in the straitjacket or the ill-fitting boot that is the Indian Act. The study that I did for the center uh, brought me to these conclusions. There are at least four things the Indian Act accomplishes. First, it, ex it establishes the authority of the executive branch of government over core areas of reserve life, everything from from marriage, from birth, from um, gainful employment, from business activity, to land management, health care, housing, everything. It also defines the relationship between individual Indians, Indians not as members of First Nations, but individuals, and the state. So issues to do with wills, for example, if you die intestate, it's not your family or your Indian government that looks after that. Under the Indian Act, it's the 
bureaucrats who were forced to administer the Indian Act. So there's a sort of a, a, double, um, <coughs> a double assumption of control over individuals and over their societies that are embedded in the actual provisions of the Act. Almost by the way, the Indian Act also creates an alternative system of government all of the First Nations, all the people who are now the First Nations government, in the First Nations, living on reserve in First Nations government, under First Nations governments, had their own system of government before, as the treaties were negotiated and long after. Those were, um, by law, under the Indian Act, those systems of um, defining a legitimate authority and social control were wiped out by the Indian Act. There were systematic efforts to stop people from following the practices that they had used for centuries. And instead, they were forced to use the Indian Act system of government. That Indian Act system of government involves um, elections every two years, uh, band councils and chiefs who are responsible mostly upward to the Department of Indian Affairs because that's where the money comes from. Um, it creates a government, a government structure that's extremely dysfunctional. I'll show you in a minute what I mean by that, but I want to make one last point. It also, if you turn your mind to the question of bureaucracy and administration, you know, how there's the part of the government that's the elected people, but most of us deal with the bureaucracy. The Indian Act also uh, set in motion certain organizational patterns for, for people living on reserve that were um, unlike those present in any other part of the country. And I've, I've just given a couple of examples here. If you read the Indian Act, there's nothing there about policy development. There's nothing there about um, meritocratic hiring. There's nothing there about a public service commission. There's nothing there about human resource development. There's nothing there about um, democratic processes for public discussion. Although it's a framework for government, it ignores most of the, or it does not deal with, does not put in place, most of the elements of a healthy modern government. Now, lots and lots of First Nations have remedied that, and they have put in place their own, uh, they re either retrieve systems that they want to retrieve, or they have put in place new systems that allow the realization of a better form of government. But remember, I'm here talking about the Indian Act, not about how people are actually able to manage underneath it. So you can imagine, for First Nations citizens, for citizens of First Nations, um, the Indian Act has not been a benign force. For at least eight generations, people have been living under that system of um, executive control. Um, and without, um, uh, ver with very little personal independence, because remember the Indian Act also creates a personal relationship between the Crown and the executive branch and individuals. There is no other group of people in our history uh, to whom that has applied, except for criminals and prisoners of war. Think about that. So, I, I, you know, I'm the bad news bear here because I'm talking about the, the intent of the Act and what the provisions uh, what they put in place. Of course, when people live, um, they found ways to work around it, they found ways to cope with it, they found ways to get rid of it. And there's a, there's a big process now of rejuvenation and renovation. But it's being done on the basis of uh, this pernicious piece of legislation whose principles go back to uh, 19th century racist colonial thinking. And that's what we have to deal with. Now, um, I just want to show you what that looks like. If you make a very schematic government of how democratic, a diagram of how democratic government works in Canada, that sort of does it. It's a terrible, terribly crude diagram, but you see the picture. You can see the arrows show you the lines of responsibility. And that's us there, the people of Canada at the bottom. If you do the same thing for the Indian Act, try to make a very um, heuristic or a, a schematized diagram of what government under the Indian Act looks like, this is what it looks like. Now you can see the lines of accountability are uh, multiple and confused. Um, responsibility goes out of the First Nation very often because of the legal provisions <coughs> of the Indian Act and because of where the money comes from. Um, and the banned administration is really caught in a vice between 
um, the overseeing distant bureaucracy and the people whom they're trying to serve. And that setup is a daily reality for the heroic people who make Indian Act government work today. And there are many places where it works. I mean, Kitaganzibi is an example of that. It works very well. But that doesn't mean it's good. Um, and this has to be acknowledged. The real, this reality has to be acknowledged. So in a nutshell, that's why I was so angry after that long winter, because I imagined what it would be to live like that. Um, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Francis. You're going to bring up your own? No, no, actually, <laughs> I have just something that I want to quote from. Okay. Uh, Roger is going to be the, our next presenter. Roger Jones is a council member of the Sagamock First Nation in Robinson Huron Treaty Territory, west of Sudbury, right, Roger? Mm -hmm. Uh, he's an independent consultant and used to work as legal and policy advisor for the Ontario Regional Chiefs of Ontario and as a senior legal counsel for the Assembly of First Nations. He's also taught at the University of Sudbury's Native Studies Department and is a founding president of the Indigenous Bar Association. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. You've got your mic. I think it's okay. I, I, I assume you can hear me. Okay, good. First of all, thank you, Claudette, for, for welcoming us to, to the territory um, of the Algonquins. And um, thank you, Jennifer, for, for the invitation. And thank you to all of you. I'm, I'm totally impressed with, <laughs> with uh, how many people are here. It's Friday afternoon, <laughs> and, um, and you probably wouldn't find me in, <laughs> in, a, in a workshop <laughs> session on a Friday afternoon. So. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you for being here, and I hope what I have to say will 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 uh, have some meaning. Um, as Jennifer pointed out, um, I serve on Sagamuk Anishinaabeg Council, so I'm an elected councillor. The rules around elected councillors and chiefs um, are both in the Indian Act and uh, regulations. You know, there's a whole set of regulations that are that are connected to the Indian Act. Um, so, so we have elections every two years because that's the term that, that, that the Indian Act sets out for, for the chief and council. We have 12 councillors, we have one chief. We have uh, about 1,800 people uh, on reserve. We have about 2,800 um, on our list, which means we still, ha you know, we have a lot of people living in urban areas or, or off reserve, which is not uncommon. Uh, as I understand it, um, the trend is that, that in most of our First Nation communities across the country, that most of the members are now living off reserve. And um, I don't think it, you know, it's, 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 um, you know, it's, um, it's an accident um, because of what um, I think the Indian Act has done in terms of preventing development um, in our communities. That's for me, that's my um, observation about what the Act has done. It, it, it has frustrated, impeded, inhibited the development of our communities. Um, and that's what I'm you know, primarily going to speak to. But I wanted to start with, um, with my community. It, it is a Robinson-Huron Treaty um, community. There's 17 communities that are part of the Robinson-Huron Treaty. The treaty goes back to 1850. Um, the Indian Act has only been around since 1876. Canada has only been around since 1867. So our relationship predates Canada's existence, uh, the existence of federal and, and provincial government. So my ancestors made treaty with uh, the Imperial Crown. Um, and, and um, before that treaty took place, there was, a, there was a commission, which was really a couple of bureaucrats back then, going into our territory, seeing who was living there, investigating uh, their reality, because they wanted to enter into treaty to access the land, because there's minerals on it, uh, mining developments. So they sent these two individuals out 
to go and investigate, report on it, and it was actually called the Vidal Anderson Commission, which is a fancy title for a couple of guys wandering around in the bush <laughs> um, and meeting people. But they did meet people. They determined in the end that, yeah, there's, peop there's indigenous people living there, Anishinaabeg, Ojibwe's, um, and determined that, that, uh, that my ancestors had land rights um, based on uh, original occupation and control. But they also observed that, that, that the communities existed as bands, and you'll see that language in the Indian Act, we're, we're called bands. Um, so the terminology, you know, relates to how um, people were observed um, in, an, in terms of their organization. And so, so he, one, one of the observations made in, in the report is, um, it says, and, and, and quote, long established custom, first of all, they describe what my people, my ancestors, did in terms of regulating and controlling land as custom versus laws. You know, that's an in, inferior um, uh, designation of, of, of what our, uh, our people did. I mean, they, they had their own laws. They didn't write them down as statues like the Indian Act, but, but people knew what their laws were. So he says, long established custom, comma, which among these uncivilized is as binding in its obligation as law in a civilized nation, meaning, um, you know, the laws that they lived by um, through uh, the imperial, um, uh, imperial government system, has divided this territory among several bands each independent of the other, having its own chief or chiefs, and possessing an exclusive right to and control over its hunting grounds. So he observes that, that, that our people, although we're an Ojibwe nation, we did exist in smaller entities to, to be able to control and regulate the territory. So, so he, he, des he describes how, um, our people are, are organized. And then, um, and then he goes on to say, the same law or custom which has thus apportioned out the territory to the various bands has bested one or more persons in each of them with a species of authority and control over its individual members and its property. Which neither well, de uh, which 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 though neither well defined nor regulated, is generally submitted to when circumstances when when circumstances require its exercise. Basically, saying these people do have a government system. They they regulate um, their relationships, you know, they're, uh, amongst each other with the land, with uh, with with uh, resources on it. I mean, he obviously determines that it's inferior, but nevertheless, it works for our people because it 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 maintains um, you know some some order, uh, authority, and control. So imagine if that system of government and organization had been allowed to to develop and evolve. Where would we be now? except for the intrusion of the Indian Act, right? Displaced all of that, which is what brings me to, um, to, to, this, um, uh, to these slides. I think um, for me in a nutshell, there's three, certainly three observations on, on my part. Um, in terms of the reality that, that I deal with at home, with the people, with the, with, the, with the staff that I deal with, with my colleagues um, on council, with the elders, with the, with the youth. Um, the colonization and racism which is embodied in the Indian Act is something which has obviously affected, affected our people. 
one of the things which, which is unusual is that it has produced an attachment in terms of you know, some of our people to the Indian Act because they don't understand it um, for, for uh, obvious reasons. You know, most people don't, don't spend any time looking at statutes, which probably includes yourselves. So, yeah, our, you know, our, our people, they don't, they don't read the Indian Act, and it's not nighttime reading. Um, <laughs> but they know something of it, and somehow they have this attachment to it, um, which, is not, which is not positive, obviously. Some of them have a false understanding about it. Um, including the notion that, that the Indian Act somehow protects and advances our rights. And, and I know why some people think that, because for instance, all of you probably have heard you know, um, discussion around tax exemption. There's a tax exemption provision in the Indian Act that says that the personal property of an Indian on reserve is not subject to taxation or seizure. Somehow people think that that's a right which you know, stems from, from, from the treaty relationship or from their, their inherent rights. Little do they know that, that if the federal government repealed the Indian Act, Section 87 is gone. Not to say that the tax exemption would be gone, but we'd have to have a big fight with Revenue Canada and with the Government of Canada about the continuing application of, of tax exemption. Um, and we, we deal regularly with the external view, our neighbors, with, with companies that we deal with that we're operating an inferior system of, of government called the Van Council. Yet, um, we're one of only two communities across this country that's ISO designated, which means we've been judged to, to, to have quality management, quality administration, and we're proud of that because we have to maintain it annually to, to, to maintain the ISO uh, certification. Um, so in a governance context, um, our governance was not allowed to develop as it should have developed naturally um, over, over that period of time. Um, and the existing legal framework really inhibits development. Um, mostly because of what the Indian Act doesn't say, or does say as well. From a capacity point of view, you know, it's important for, for any government to have good, uh, good capacity, good HR, good policies, good procedures. Um, the human skills that we have among our, our bureau bureaucrats um, are limited to, to the existing governance framework which of course is narrow, and I'll, I'll point some of that out. And uh, the existing governance framework won't attract the best and the brightest to come and work for us because of those limitations. So um, we're at a disadvantage. You know, a lot of these people that are living off the reserve, they're professionals. They've, you know, they've earned their, their, their education credentials, they've got a wealth of experience working where, where they have, they could easily come home and work for us. But the continuing reality of our, of our Indian Act situation uh, doesn't encourage people to, to actually come home. Now, I, I'm going to run through this very quickly. One of the things that I've looked at in the past <coughs> about what, what, what inhibits us as, as a people to develop is um, I've looked at what happens in the international context. First Nation communities, in, in some respects, are third world countries or, or third world communities, certainly from a governance point of view, because they, they haven't developed. Um, and probably economically. And you know, government power is important in developing your economy. We don't have it. Um, so, so personally, I, you know, I liken our situation to, to a third world situation. The UN Development Program looks at and helps third world countries develop. 
Now, one of the things that they've come up with is what they call a capable government uh, concept, telling, telling countries, look, focus on these issues. Don't worry about you know, a whole range of other issues. Focus on these issues in terms of your development, um, which includes, uh, well, first of all, I, I wanted to show you, you know, this is, the, this is probably what you're familiar with in terms of how government is normally organized. You know, you've got the executive branch, you know, in, the, in our case, or in the case of Canada, the prime minister, the cabinet, doing these things, decision making, policy, financial management, economic policy. Then you've got the legislative branch, the House of Commons. Then you've got the judicial branch, you know, we've got courts um, at all levels. Um, and um, the key functions of government is, you know, establishing and maintaining a judicial system. We don't have a judicial system in our communities. So although we have an executive, like in terms of chief and counsel, and counsel is also authorized to make some laws, bylaws they call them, we got no place to enforce them. Um, there was provision, and there is provision in the Indian Act for what's called a uh, Section 107 Justice of the Peace which I understand would have provided some measure of, of, a, of a judicial or, or uh, enforcement mechanism. As I understand, the Justice Department in the, in the 60s decided that they didn't want to implement 107 because it was going to cost a lot of money. They would have had to train people to be JPs, and then they would have had to pay them to, to maintain them in office. So money couldn't do it. Um, and um, so we're, you know, we, we, we're working without um, an arm of government in terms of being able to function uh, effectively and, 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 uh, and forcefully. Um, the implementation, formulation and implementation of ma macroeconomic policies we have no lawmaking authority in terms of economic development or regulating commerce, trade, zoning. Um, so it's hard to create the conditions for economic development in your community by you know, trying to attract outside business, external investment. Um, when, we, when we can't produce the, the conditions for them to come to the reserve and do business there. Um, we have no lawmaking authority in terms of our environment um, to do environmental assessments. We rely on, on Indian Affairs and, and um, its, its policies and procedures. Social policies, much of what we have by way of social programs and, and services comes from contribution agreements with Canada and Ontario. So we really don't have any, any policy-making authority when it comes to trying to deal with the situations in our communities. And th those are serious, you know, serious issues related to social, social dysfunction. And we're operating with Ottawa-generated um, policies and services, which are pretty far removed from, from reserve realities. Um, we have no authority in terms of internal external trade, um, which is hugely important, again, in terms of trying to develop an economy. You know, in our community, we have probably about 80% leakage. You know, money comes in, money goes out, and it doesn't circulate at all, for, for the most part. It's just, it's just, we just have no retention. We really have no, no lawmaking authority in terms of health or education, a couple of important areas. The only Indian Act provision relating to education is what is, is the provision that allowed government to make agreements with religious orders for residential schools. Health, we can regulate noxious weeds. Um, we, can, we can impose um, uh, some, some requirements around um, inoculation and so on and so forth, but, but nothing Beekeeping. big. <laughs> Sorry? Beekeeping. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's, of course, that's an important, yeah. Uh, 
Everyone should have beekeeping um, <laughs> authority. <laughs> and, and we have no research and development capacity, which is huge, right? Because you have, you have to be able to, to, um, um, to deal with, with our global reality these days. I mean, we, we exist in a, in, in a truly global society. Now, the other thing that I wanted to point out is that a few years ago, Harvard did a study on tribal governments in the United States, which, which identified why are some tribal governments successful and why aren't others? They could actually be neighbors. And they came up with these conclusions that practical self-rule was an, a necessary ingredient, meaning making your own laws, having your own jurisdiction, not delegated power or administration, which is what the Indian Act is. Effective institutions of self-governance, um, including you know, having constitutions, you know, having courts, you know, having an effective bureaucracy. Cultural match, meaning you don't simply adopt someone else's governance system and, and, and formulations. You have to reflect. Like, like I said, you know, what would our governments have looked like had they been allowed to, to develop and evolve you know, um, uh, prior to the imposition of the Indian Act? Um, strategic orientation, we live year to year because our agreements are mostly year to year with the federal government in terms of funding. Although we had, sometimes we have five-year agreements, block funding agreements, but for the most part, we live year to year. And it's hard to, to, to plan your development in that context. Leadership is hugely important. I think we've been fortunate in Sagamook to have good leadership. Um, but, you know, the, the Indian Act is silent on leadership. You know, you elect the chief and you elect the council. It doesn't say anything else about what they do. I know that our chief works 24-7. And, and um, he's, he's good at what he does. But again, it's stuff that we do, as Francis pointed out, really outside of the Indian Act. We, we, we sort of do our own policy work and we try and design what, what, what our governance is and what people should do. Um, but it's not in the Indian Act. It doesn't help. Um, so, so just to summarize, Indian Act governance, there's no recognition of sovereign or self-governing powers in the Indian Act. Institutional and governance development has been inhibited by the Indian Act. Um, nothing in the Indian Act that reflects traditional governance, and it never will, except for maybe titles, right? Chief. Um, Indian Act governance is based on short-term realities as influenced by annual financial contributions. Leadership selection based on Indian Act rules. One of the things that you should know is that you don't have to be an Indian or a member of our community to be elected chief. As a counselor, yes, but not chief. Um, so, and then it doesn't provide the context or the framework in which, well, what's the authority of the chief? What is his or her role and function to, to, to be able to serve our community and constituency in the best possible main way in terms of, of governance and, and development. So I'll leave it at that. And thank you again for your, for your time and attention. Thank you, Roger. Thank you very much. Okay. Douglas, you're up next. <laughs> Uh, Douglas Anderson is an associate professor in the Faculty of Law at the University of Toronto. He earned his Juris Doctor at the University of Toronto and his LLM at Columbia University where he was a Fulbright Fellow. And Douglas is a member of the Opaskwayak Cree Nation in Manitoba. Mm -hmm. Douglas. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Nitikini son Amapanashi, you missed me again. My Cree name is Amapanashi, which means hummingbird, and I'm from the beaver clan of the Opasquiat Cree Nation. And I want to thank Jennifer for inviting me here today, and um, it's so nice to be here uh, on Algonquin territory. I want everyone to close your eyes for just a minute. Uh, if you work for the Department of Indian Affairs, raise your hand. <laughs> 
<laughs> hey, if you work for CSIS, just look furtive. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a restaurant opening in my neighborhood. Uh, it's going to serve indigenous and aboriginal foods. And uh, as it turns out, this Cameroonian German guy that I know actually knows the Ojibwe chef. And so he said, uh, they're doing some renos in the restaurant. You should pop by. So. I went up to the restaurant, and uh, there were these two women, uh, a Haudenosaunee and an Ojibwe artist, who were doing the murals. And I went in, and I spoke to them, and we hung out for a little while. And then we did what modern, urban, professional Indians do. We exchanged cards. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll notice that Roger and I and Elder Commander are here in our modern, traditional regalia. <laughs> and this is important to note. Because we are a modern people. And we were a modern people in 1500. We were a modern people when Quebec was founded. We were a modern people when the Constitution came. We were modern people in 1982. We have always been your modern contemporaries. Right? You think of us sometimes as these kind of old people who have these old practiced ways and old cultures. But we're not that. We're modern people. I think you know the takeaway from the Truth of Reconciliation Commission, the most important lesson to be learned there, was that for a time, maybe even into today, Canadians believed that indigenous cultures were less valuable than their own, that our languages didn't matter, that we as a people were inferior. But that's a lie. We are a modern people. Our languages are beautiful. They describe relationships with the earth, relationship between all beings, in ways that English and French can't even imagine. In my language, in Cree, you know, I can just talk to you in English. I can just address you as this uniform mass. At least in French, I have to choose you know, feminine or masculine. <laughs> in, in Cree, I would have to think about what is my relationship to you? <coughs> Am I thinking about you as part of my family, as part of my clan? Am I thinking about you as an elder, or as a student? Our languages are beautiful, and they deserve to be promoted. Now, uh, sir, I'm, I, I'm a law professor at the University of Toronto, which means I usually just get to talk until people start putting things in their bags and leave it. <laughs> um, and because that is my distinct pleasure, I don't own a watch. I just wait for people to start packing their laptops up. <laughs> so uh, Jennifer, if I go log, please just let me know. So I have had a relationship with the Indian Act since I was about 12. My mother uh, was a status Indian, uh, which means she was registered as an Indian with the federal government. And she married my father, who was Ojibwe and Cree, but not a status Indian. He was not registered. And so uh, a couple months after they got married, she got this letter in the mail. She was being deregistered as an Indian. Uh, she lost her status which includes things like the right to be buried in the reserve. You know, it's significant. And she did not become less Cree. She just was not suddenly an Indian anymore. And they married, and they had my sister, and then I was born. Uh, my father was in the Air Force, so I was actually, I'm a German-born uh, Cree Indian. Uh, I was born in Lar. We moved back to Canada. And then there was a lawsuit in the, uh, in the 80s called Lovelace. And people said, you know, that's totally discriminatory. That Because in those days, if a man married a non-status woman, uh, she became an Indian. But the other way, you weren't an Indian. You lost your status. So obviously discriminatory lawsuit. And uh, so my mom got her status back. And as a result, uh, my sister and I became uh, status Indians. And uh, I remember my mom told me that, you know, that had happened, and I was confused. And 
you know, she went, she'd gone to residential school, so we did not, you know, she, she did her best as a mother, but I don't remember us having like long conversations about Indianness. Uh, but I was a curious child and I, I did what curious children growing up in Northern British Columbia do when they become Indians. I wrote the Department of Indian Affairs. I said, I'm a status Indian. What's the deal? <laughs> and they replied. <laughs> they, a, a month or so later, this envelope arrived, and I opened it up, and there was a copy of the Indian Act. <laughs> and that's it. No covering, no, no annotations. Just like this dry description of governance and stuff. It was, So uh, years go by and I go to law school and you know now I get to think about this stuff a little more seriously. I wish I still had that letter actually. <laughs> so the Indian Act defines a relationship between First Nations people and uh, the Crown. And right now what it looks like as Roger spoke about is this sort of delegated kind of municipal authority, stuff like dog catching. But what it doesn't have is the ability, and this is probably one of the most important things, the Indian Act does not provide power of taxation. So if you want to know, you must think to yourself, wow, there's been a boil of water advisor in that reserve for 37 years. What the hell? Why don't they just fix that thing? because they can't raise the money to fix that thing. Governments need to tax people and corporations in order to raise money to set and achieve ends. So imagine you're the city of Ottawa, and there's no property taxes. You want to fix the road. Oh, well, huh. <laughs> So First Nations, they have extremely limited powers of taxation. But you've got to tax something. You can't actually own land on reserves. You can't have the property taxes. You can tax some transactions on the reserve. But the reserves are small. And people are not like trading in Mercedes-Benz and stuff. So the amount of ta in my community, we tax the gas. So that raises you know, some money. I think you know, we largely support a hockey team with that, but that's people's choices. <laughs> but it wasn't supposed to be this way. We, we don't even forget. Most of you never learned. There was a period of time from about 1600 maybe even through to 1840 or 1850, when British and French governments learned our traditions and ways. We lived along the Great Lakes and the Eastern Seaboard in a relative political and economic detente. We worked together. We learned each other's languages. The British and French learned wampum diplomacy. They learned to make wampum belts. They learned to enter into agreements with us according to our indigenous protocols. You know, the British Imperial Crown was good at this stuff. They'd been, you know, meeting others for a long time. And they knew that you couldn't just barge in and, you know, declare your law as the imperial law. You know, there were, these ideas were contested. The idea that Europeans had any rights in land at all were contested. You know, John Locke, when he's writing, he's not thinking in the abstract about like, oh, well, what if we did find a place with Indians? <laughs> what would that be like? And John Locke was a guy who had investments in uh, colonies. He was writing constitutions. And he was writing because he had to convince people that they were wrong because the prevailing view in Europe at this time was that we can't take Indian land, they own it. John Locke had to convince people that they could. The idea of 
British superiority and British rights and land, these were all contested through history. It's not until about 1850 that things fall apart. But along the way, something happens. The French get defeated here in Canada. And when that happens, they sign a treaty called the Treaty of Paris. One of the terms of the Treaty of Paris is that French Indian allies have to be protected and recognized as sovereigns. And the property interests have to be recognized. And now the British sign a treaty, and they realize, whoa, that's super going to piss off our Indian allies if we don't do the same thing for them. We've got to do something about that. So they issue the Royal Proclamation. Can I get that for the bottom? Thanks. Sorry, Francis. Thank you so much. The Royal Proclamation of 1763 recognizes, it draws a line. It says, OK, so we've, we've done some subtly stuff. But there's the line. After that, we recognize it's all yours. And we're going to enter into treaty with you if we're going to take up any more lands for settlement. And we recognize that you are sovereign entities. You're governing. You're a people. And you're modern. And we owe you. Which is nice. But the British at this time, remember, they understand Indian traditions, First Nation traditions. And they realize they can't just issue a royal proclamation and all the Indians are going to go like, yay. <laughs> they have to do it the right way. So in the fall of 1763, they send out messengers all across the territories to come to a treaty at Niagara in 1764. And the chiefs come, 2,000 of them, representing 23 or more nations. They come from as far north as Hudson Bay. They come from the Mississippi Basin. They come in from as far uh, east uh, as, or west as Alberta. And you know, they come through each other's territories. And they have to negotiate that political space with one another. Right? We speak different languages. We have different cultures. We're territorial. And they have to navigate by canoe through these territories. And not just the human space. They have to negotiate and treat with water beings and caribou councils and wolf councils. The spirits of the land themselves, they're entering into new territories that they do not understand. They're coming a long way. And they arrive in 1764. And when they arrive, the British welcome them and enter into treaty at Niagara to affirm for the British the terms of the Royal Proclamation. And then they exchange wampum belts. The British prepare wampum belts because they know that that is the only way that they can affirm a deal on terms with indigenous people. And First Nations representatives give two belts. One of them is uh, Gaswentha. It's a very old belt. It's the covenant chain belt. It was first given by the Haudenosaunee to the Dutch. It's a very simple belt. It's white. It has two blue rows. And the rows represent the political sovereignty of each nation. And to the First Nations who were there, when they give that belt, the British understand. They don't, they're not like, what is this? Nice. I think I'll hang it. They have been in that tradition for 200 years. They know what's being affirmed. In 1867, when the Constitution comes in, the federal government is given exclusive authority to legislate with respect to Indians and lands reserved for Indians in Section 9124. Now, politically for First Nations, that's still a relationship with the federal crown. So maybe that's going to be OK. But then, Section 89 or 88 of the Indian Act comes in. It used to be Section 87, I think. 87, now it's 88. What Section 88 does is it means that all laws of general application of province apply as federal law on an Indian reserve. Now what that does legally is it eats up the entire jurisdictional space for governance. Right? Every law that a province makes now applies on an Indian reserve. 
So the idea that First Nations were going to be governing of themselves. Governing means the ability to pass laws. Section 88 eats up that entire jurisdictional field. Property, civil rights, health care, everything that a province does is removed from the jurisdictional sphere of First Nations. And what do we get? Dog catching. Imagine like beekeeping is enumerated as a specific provision of authority. We went from being self-governing nations to someone else telling us we can regulate beekeeping. That's how little jurisdictional space is left under the Indian Act. This jurisdiction extends to determining who is legally an Indian, right? We don't get to decide that in our own communities. Now, some people have suggested that maybe one of the answers to the conditions in reserve life is the privatization of property. Now, this is an actual issue. Section 89 of the Indian says that you can't seize property on reserve, you can't, which means that you can't get a mortgage, right? The bank won't lend you money if you default on that loan, and then they can't seize the property. Well, so in practical terms, what this means is that First Nations people don't have access to capital. Right? So you want to start a business? You got to raise money? Maybe I'll mortgage my home? No, you won't. Well, I have a car. You can use my car as collateral. Is it on reserve? No. Is everything that you own on reserve because you live on reserve? Yeah. Can't raise any money. So that's a problem. Maybe if we made it possible for Indians to get access to mortgages, then maybe we can grow their economies. So say some. But without the powers of taxation, without the ability to build communities, without all the regulatory things that Roger's spoken about, there's no economy. Which means if you do this, if you privatize land, it's just a way of transferring land into the hands of banks. How are people going to repay their loans? Right? You need fundamental changes to the economies of First Nations before we can think about simple ideas like privatizing land. Privatizing land might do a lot of things, but it's not going to solve poverty. Probably what it's going to do, and we've seen this before in the States under the Dawes Act. Under the Dawes Act, they privatized Indian land. 80% of it ended up in the hands of uh, non-Indians. And of the remaining 20%, more than three quarters of that land is non-arable. It's gravel. Right? We've done this before. We've seen it with uh, Métis script lands in Manitoba. So that's not the right approach if there's no economy. And so we need to think about how do we develop an economy. If you look on a map of Canada, Canada's big. Reserves, in comparison, tiny. Our traditional territories cover the whole place. There's no like spot in Canada that was not originally somebody's traditional territory. If we want to get out of the Indian Act, if we want to rethink what it is we're going to do about First Nations, we need to think about First Nations taxing in their traditional territories. All across the north, here in Ontario, it's like basically no crown representative. Fly-in communities, there's 47, I think, here. There's no roads, no post office. First Nations who live up there live under the jurisdiction of someone else. I think that their traditional territories should be recognized so that they can tax the people who come and use their lands. In Ontario alone, forest companies collect or forest companies pay the Ontario government a billion dollars in stumpage fees annually. That's not the value of the timber. That's what they pay the province for the right to cut down trees in indigenous territories. I think indigenous people should be the ones who collect those stumpage fees. 
They should be the one to determine who's going to put in a mine, what they're going to pay. Now, it's true that that's a billion dollars coming out of the economy of Ontario. And that's a lot of money. And as an Ontario taxpayer, I think, someone's going to make that up. You know, we have a way of thinking through these sorts of uh, balancing acts. It's called fiscal federalism. Now, the actual formula is, like, I think two people on Earth understand how provinces pay in. <laughs> but the general <laughs> idea is, if you're doing well as a province, you pay in. If you're not, you pay out. Ontario is a have-not province now because uh, I think we get 19 billion, or we, I think we pay 23 billion and we get 4 billion back, so we're a have-not now. But First Nations could live in this formula too. We could collect up the money and we could pay it out into the federal formula when we're doing well. And in this way, you might finally realize that your economies of the South have always been subsidized by indigenous people. We'd just be making it an economic reality. Thinking about getting out of the Indian Act means thinking about Section 88. It means, about, it, it means thinking about, these are big steps too, by the way. This is not like, well, we're just going to do some regs and fix, do a little ledge fix. <laughs> right? This is about fundamentally rethinking jurisdictional space and authority. It's about rethinking economy. But it's also about recognizing the reality that our communities of the North subsidize the South. I just think that it's time you know, we actually recognize that. And First Nations got a decent cut of that. And First Nations were the ones who said, ah, I don't think you should put a mine there. Um, I realize it would be good economically, but our people are going to be here until the sun explodes. It's not like next generation. We're going to be here for another 10 or 100,000 years. So we're really best placed to make those kinds of decisions. Not because we want to deny economy, not because we want the South to suffer, because we want the South to prosper. Our trade networks are ancient, North and South. We've been governing these economies for thousands of years. And this is not knowledge that is lost. This is knowledge that isn't recognized because there's no jurisdictional space to acknowledge those areas of wisdom. We're a modern people. We have modern ideas about how to govern ourselves, about how to keep you guys in libraries, and all the other stuff you get. What we need is a way of supporting our communities in the same way that southern communities support themselves. Through taxation, through stumpage fees, through various royalties from resource development. That's what finances all these roads, the ability to tax property. That's what funds your libraries and your water systems. And if you don't have the money to fix your water system, you can go and issue bonds, which is a form of getting a loan. We need those modern tools. But we just can't get the tools. We also need the resources. And some of those resources just are jurisdiction over space. Sometimes I hear a lot of my indigenous colleagues saying, we want our land back. I always think, what does that even mean? It's not like a violin. You can't like pack it up and give it back to me. <laughs> Getting our land back means just recognizing our authority over those lands. And it's time that we did something about that. Miigwech. Thank you.